Welcome to episode number 125 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. Today, we have Dylan Jerry. Dylan is uh, dialing in today all the way from South Africa. Dylan uh, describes himself as a distracted entrepreneur. And as I go through his bio and you hear some of the amazing things he's been up to, you'll, you'll understand why. Uh, Dylan's personal uh, vision is to be the, you know, the breath that connects humans to leap into the highest self. Now, he, he does that in various ways. One of the ways he's been the founder of Kilowatt Audiovisual, which he started 15 years ago. And Kilowatt uh, runs over 700 events in four different locations. They've built uh, an amazing world-class team uh, and an event studio. They have seven purpose-built production studios down there in Cape Town. And outside of that, Dylan keeps himself very busy, um, you know, making world-class team building events. I, you know, myself and my team, we've experienced uh, the power of his innovation workshop. And he additionally does a lot of things that are very, um, very adrenaline focused. You know, whether it be motor racing, paddle tennis, uh, hey, or rafting. Rafting, Dylan, I know you're going to tell us about the rafting as well. And he, he's even completed four Ironman triathlons and the London Marathon. So Dylan, uh, welcome to the show today. Thanks very much, Kevin. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, still got a little bit of a croak from uh, the early wake up, but I'm starting to get used to that uh, with some Australian friends and clients now. How are you today? Uh, fantastic. And I've been very excited for this. The uh, the croak in my voice is is gone. Uh, you know, I've been up very, very much longer than you. Uh, we're a little <laughs> bit later in the day here. And I've been so excited to speak to you because... Uh, as I said, I've had the privilege of uh, being part of your events. You, you know, been a, a customer of yours and you've given us such an amazing experience. But I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. I, I shared quite a few eclectic things. There's so many different things going on for you. Mm. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your journey, you know, from the time that you, uh, you founded this business, you know, right up to what you're doing today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think that for me, school was, was a big struggle. And, and on top of that, I moved from an Afrikaans school to an English school in high school. And so I felt quite lonely. And uh, I'm sure most entrepreneurs can relate with that. And then um, I continued to get bored as well in school. So I used to do quite well in the first term. And then the second, third and fourth term, I do really badly. And uh, and ended up leaving school with like a 5% maths grade and not being able to get into university with my grades. I almost immediately set out uh, on an entrepreneurial journey by starting a small IT company and then realized that I didn't have the skills to run a business. So I went into a corporate and to make a long story short, I, I ultimately started Kilowatt Audiovisual in 2007 with li very little funding resources and, um, and, and just pure tenacity and, and grinding away was able to build a business. And um, in 2012, I'd say one of the most pivotal sort of points in my in my entrepreneurial journey was joining the Entrepreneurs Organization, which is a global organization for entrepreneurs that really focuses on helping them to learn and grow and to develop themselves, not just in the business space, but as humans, fathers, spouses, in every aspect of your life. And very soon after joining EO, I realized that while I had, you know, now an average to maybe be above average business, I was the business. I was doing the event design. I was at the cold face. I was having the excitement of engaging with the clients, making the sale um, and getting involved. But I realized very quickly that my business was worth nothing without me. And so I set off on this four-year journey to try and create succession in my business. And it was a very, very tough time of my life because I, I moved completely out of the coal face, moved out of the excitement sort of, of of being at the events. At that stage, we had about 40 employees. And I really just started focusing on running a business. And um, and it was it was lonely, it was filled with problems and uh, and challenges. And and I just felt like I didn't have all the excitement that I used to have. But very soon I realized that as I started stepping out of the way, my business started doing better. 
And it was partly, uh, you know, we joked a little bit in, in the beginning about being a distracted entrepreneur. Um, I'm not sure if I have ADHD. My wife thinks I do. My wife thinks I have a special version of ADHD, which is ADHOGTS, attention deficit. Oh, God, there's a squirrel. So it's a <laughs> exponentially more um, dramatic version of ADHD. <laughs> Um, but what I would do is, you know, walk into a team meeting and, you know, for example, everyone had spent a week deciding on why the curtains needed to be blue. And I would walk in and go, why have you chosen blue curtains? You need uh, red curtains. And, uh, and I think when I sort of stepped out of the way, things actually started going better. And then I realized that I had this passion for strategy and culture. And I really started to enjoy watching people grow and watching people in our country come from the poverty line and get their driver's license or be empowered to buy a house, be empowered to buy a second house, be empowered to learn new skills. And I realized that this was really my purpose. And, um, and so then I was very fortunate in 2018 through EO to finally get to university. I managed to go to Boston in Harvard and study entrepreneurial strategy, which all sounds amazing on LinkedIn, but really was just a one week course and taught me amazing things. But, but just that was sort of this divergent path of me starting Circle Forward, which is another business that really seeks to help companies overcome some of the cultural challenges that I had. And, and use some of the tools that I had learned to implement in Kilowatt that set me free from the business operationally, but to empower people to become stronger and better versions of themselves, which then effectively resulted in the company becoming a stronger and better company. And so that's really what I resonate with today. Um, I can live my purpose in both companies. It does become quite tricky on how you split your time. But, um, but having a lot of fun. And, and I think that the, the team building aspect of it came from COVID and just this need that we've seen for people to connect and we can facilitate those connections. So we're quite heavily focused on connecting on, and reconnecting people at the moment. So that in a nutshell is, uh, is the life story of, of Dylan the Entrepreneur. Wow, it's uh, and what a great summary you've given to us there, and so many different things I, I and rabbit holes I'd like to de delve down there. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about that experience because you focus there on your journey of, of I think you described as getting out of the way or stepping back to allow mm. your team to, to flourish and grow. What are some of the key uh, insights or wisdom you would have to share with someone else who's still stuck in their business? It's, it's all dependent on them. What are some of the important things they may need to think about if they're going to achieve what you have, which is to be able to step aside and allow the team to, to run it without them? Um, so look, I, I need to preface that and say that, that everyone shows up in the world differently. Everyone has a different way of doing things. And, um, and for me, my, my biggest fear is structure. I really, you know, I want to wake up every day and I want the day to be different and exciting and, you know, I, I, I want to experience life in that way. So, so to-do lists for me were a big challenge and they would drive my family crazy because I would put to-do list in my calendar and I would also often put to-dos on my iPhone, but not as a reminder, as an alarm. So <laughs> like, there's always alarms going off to like remind <laughs> me about doing things. And I think the point I'm trying to make is that I think that a lot of entrepreneurs live their lives off to-do lists and they only feel productive if they've gotten through the day ticking off lots of things off their to-do list. And I think that I grappled with that for ages. I really like, I'm not getting through my to-do list. The, the one thing I got is that every day at the end of the day, I moved all of the stuff that I didn't get done onto another to-do list for the next day. I was quite good at that. And, um, and, and so I really felt like, am I working? Am I being productive? I'm not getting through all of these things. And then I read Cal Newport's Deep Work book. Um, I don't know if you've read it. Great book. And I realized that, that as business owners and actually just as humans, 
we have become so fueled by dopamine and distraction um, that we never get a chance to get into flow or to think about something on a deeper level. And I think that is the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make. That's what keeps them in their business is the fact that they constantly have something to do and they never create a space for them to be able to really think about what it is that the next step in their business is going to be. And it's, it, 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 it's you know, if, if you sit down and you have a budget challenge, you can sit down with someone in finance or, you know, a friend or a mentor, and you can open up an Excel spreadsheet and you can put together a plan and you can immediately start working away. But if you want to figure out like where you want to be in 10 years time or what you want your culture to look like or how you're going to exit your business, it's not something that's going to come to you in one session. It's going to be creating that time to think. And then one day you will be hiking or you'll be in the shower and it will come to you. And, and, and so I think that, that the to-do list and optimization is really the enemy of the entrepreneur. I love that. So get rid of your to-do list and create that time to think. And that's yeah, going to be like, uh, have a very... not to do list and, a not and, list. <laughs> and, you know, like, I think one of the things, and this, this is very controversial. People like get highly anxious when I say this, but one of the ways I measure my success and how well I've gotten out of the way of my business is how many unread emails I have and how many unread WhatsApps I have. And, and right now, I think, and I use AI filtering, I have over 500 unread emails and I have 93 unread WhatsApps. And, and that makes some people extremely paranoid. But for me, it tells me that I've set up an organization that someone can find what they need and I don't have to worry about getting to a zero inbox every day because that's a non-cognitive task. It's not really adding any value to my life. And it's just another thing on the to-do list that stresses me out. So I don't okay. know how you feel about that, but some people go mad when I tell them that story. <laughs> I, I, I was having a, a debate uh, with this with a, a client uh, on the previous call, actually. And he's, his inbox is zero, is always zero. He gets it to zero. Um, I, I don't I don't have the, I don't have the drive in the same way. I know the important messages I need to see, and I yeah. take care of those. But the other ones not so important. I, you know they can they can get taken care of later. So clients uh, client messages done on it. Uh, other people with their marketing messages they, they can wait as well. So yeah. I, I love the the principle that you're saying though is we can get so wrapped up in you know managing through the emails or managing through the to do list. Um, and not actually tackling the things that are strategically important or significant, they're going to move things forward. So uh, I think the key message here from Dylan is let's carve out that time. How do you carve out that time to think about it? And maybe you can't carve out, you know, five days a week on this, but can you start out with carving out a little bit of time on your Friday morning or your Friday afternoon? Can you get a block of time where, you know, it's, it's strategic time where you're not reacting to anything else that's going on in the organization is where you're actually planning about uh, how to grow the business and, and make things happen. Uh, Dylan, you, you mentioned in there, around your experience uh, with Harvard University and how that inspired you a little bit more with Circle Forward. Tell us a little bit more about that because clearly you've had success in your business, putting together a team and creating an amazing culture. And now you're taking those skills and helping other organizations through that. So tell us a little bit about some of the unique and innovative ways that you're doing that. Yeah, I think in COVID, I had um, I had quite a lot of time on my hands. I had already um, done this entrepreneurial strategy uh, course at Harvard. And I, the following year, I went to Miami and got accredited as a strategy summit facilitator. And I think it's important that I also share that, you know, I'm not a consultant, I'm a facilitator. And, and I, I facilitate conversations because I believe that the answer is in the room. And so that I really loved that because it really helped me again to get people to tap into themselves and to bring forward the best version of themselves. And so I started playing around with that um, and, and, and doing a lot of work for EO, facilitating, picking up a couple of clients through EO and starting to facilitate for EO, starting to facilitate strategy in my business 
um, up until that point, strategy in our business was really always just throwing a dart at a dartboard and going, what are we going to do this year? It was numbers based. Um, and, and, you know, because I come from a sales background, we'd very often hit the numbers, but we'd make no profit because I wasn't looking at any of the other things uh, in the business. And so like, I started to enjoy helping people with strategy, but I felt that I still wanted to connect with people on a deeper level. And so I started studying the Enneagram, uh, which is a tool that helps us understand how we show up in the world and how to make us more aware of all the tools that are available to us um, as humans to engage with the world. And so, so that really helped me. And then in COVID, I did a, a, a bit of a course in, on executive coaching and management coaching. And all of these things started to build a little bit of a business um, that really started or quite organically. Um, and then, as, as I said, in COVID, I saw that, that there was this massive need for people to reconnect. You know, I saw that cultures were failing in businesses. And, and we all know that culture doesn't fail like a car accident, it fails like a cancer, you know, it's like over time it degrades and then all of a sudden it's gone. And, um, and I started to see that like trust started breaking down, you know, um, people like if I was five minutes late for a zoom call, it would be because of the power or it would be because there was someone at the door, my kid was screaming. But if you as my colleague were five minutes late for a zoom call, it would be like disrespectful. How could you be late for a zoom call? You're at home. And so I felt like there has to be a way to, to help people connect on a better level. And, and so I developed a couple of team building, um, offerings. Um, and I really try to focus on trying to build relationships over Zoom or over Teams or over this sort of virtual environment that we were stuck in. And um, and now today, Circle Forward has become like a fully fledged company. And um, I've got clients all over the world um, from doing work with some U US government state departments, right down to small entrepreneurs that have just started their entrepreneurial journey. And it's extremely exciting because it really helps me live my purpose and, uh, and, and I'm really enjoying it. And you have a very uh, unique skill and a very unique approach to it. Uh, I, I know I mentioned at the top of the show, I experienced this from a perspective of a customer and I, with two different teams, two different organizations I work with, uh, you know, had you come in and, and do some, some great work with them. And now I know you have many different ways that you uh, help facilitate these groups with, with the two that you did with us, it was around innovation. And I remember it was so much fun. I, uh, the team you know, really haven't laughed that hard and felt that connected. And I think what it, uh, what it opened up for us is, we got to see each other in a slightly different way and we got to connect with each other and, and see, you know, maybe the person who is more, normally more, um, you know, uh, structure and procedure in the business, they were being very creative and very fun. And it, just, it allowed us to kind of showcase different strengths. So uh, I've, I've really enjoyed the experiences that I've had with those. And of course, uh, now you're, you're getting connected with organizations all around the world. How do you, uh, how do you land, uh, you know, the U.S. State Department? That's a, a pretty, pretty great result off of a business that uh, is, is relatively new. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's one that I'm extremely proud of and I'm really enjoying working with them. Um, they are um they're a federation of, of the state medical boards. And um it, it's come through word of mouth, really. It's a lot of it comes through the organization. Um often I would be doing facilitation at an organizational level for EO, and in there will be 12 entrepreneurs that are board that are board members of that city's chapter and they'll go I want this in my business I want to I want to do this in my business and then locally as well just word of mouth you know people having fun people learning about themselves and then sharing that and uh and uh, and that's how the business comes in and and it it, it it's one of the frustrations as well, because it reminds me of the dichotomy of being a distracted entrepreneur, because we've got so many products and so many marketing ideas, but my website needs to be updated. And, and like my Instagram page should have been started like three months ago, but, <laughs> but really 
at the end of the day, like this business has got traction and momentum and, but, but it's like early stage again, you know, I, 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 I exited a business operationally where there was people to execute things on a strategic level. And now I'm in another business, which is like a completely different world because I'm having to send uh, invoices to clients and I'm having to like figure out what the agenda is going to look like. And I'm having to do all the other things that uh, that like a startup entrepreneur needs to do. And so it, it is fun, but um, but it is sometimes challenging as well. Uh, fun and challenging. And uh, it's it's great that you have two businesses and one established and one that you're uh, you're growing now. And I guess for you you cry you uh, you said you crave the uh, you know the the new stimulus and the new things. It certainly must be uh, giving you that level of excitement. Uh, Dylan, tell us a little bit more. Uh, you, we may have heard of some of this already, but what do you think is the secret to running a successful business? So for me, I really believe that the the secret is in the people. I really believe that um, that that if you can figure out how to empower people to live the best version of themselves, and you you have a team of people that are all focused on doing that, then uh, then then your business will be successful. Um, and for me, it's as simple as that. It's it's the people you have that are going to determine whether your business is successful or not. And and I think that I think that there's a lot of arguments and debates around how you employ people, what are good people, what are bad people, how do you get a culture fit, how do you get value alignment. Um, but I really think even now more than ever, it's down to that. It's like, can you find people that are aligned to your values? And can you teach them the missing skills that they need? And, and once you unlock that and the ability for them to see their own potential, you'll be successful in business. I love that. Three really core elements there then. So one, uh, empowering the people and really making sure you're connecting with them in, in terms of alignment of values. And then number three, building the skills in them. So mm. what, what a great trio of things that you've mentioned there. Didn't and we, it's, we sorry to cut you off, but it's interesting. It's, it, it's very often you speak to CEOs and, and I do strategy facilitation, but very often people will go, it's like, oh, we had a great long-term vision and we were very like rigidly stuck to our strategy. And, you know, it's... <laughs> I don't know. I feel like sometimes maybe that's that's like a more humble way of taking the credit of being an awesome CEO. When in actual fact, it's it's the team that you know it's the the group of people that are moving the company forward that that makes you win. That's it. And you what's the saying? Uh, if you want to go far, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with a team, right? And so I think yeah, it's uh, really, really important absolutely. around that. And I think the values piece is really critical. You mentioned CEOs. I've connected with CEOs in very large organizations. And they, you know, every three years, I go through this activity of creating some values, and they'll put them up on a notice board somewhere. But then no one in the organization actually actually ever lives by them. No one actually uh, makes sure the day-to-day -day things that we're, we're doing the things to be in alignment with those values. So it kind of, it never works. The organization kind of runs its own course anyway. So I think having those values, Dylan, what, tell me about that in your organization. You've set your values mm -hmm. and you have clear values. How do you help uh, embed them and make sure that the team yeah. are, uh, are living by them? So look, I think in the beginning, we all have a mission and we have a vision and we have values. And that's just because we get taught what to do uh, by sort of Western business experts. And, uh, and I think over time, as I've matured, I've, um, you know, I've kind of learned to understand that like having the massive paragraph of what your purpose is or what your vision is or what your mission is like not even i used to be able to remember it it would sound great when we <laughs> workshopped it and um and the same with values and so you know i believe that the whole organization needs to be part of that you know it shouldn't just come from from one team of people or even just from the founder and so what we did most recently, which was at the start of COVID, we, we became a different business. We were forced to become a different business. And we were forced to relook re what our purpose and ambition is and what our values were. And so I'm a big fan of Kahoot. And Kahoot has a brainstorming uh, sort of 
product built into it. And we basically took all of our staff and we started saying like, what do you think our values are in this organization? And, um, and, and, you know, we sort of said like, if people speak about us, what are the things that they, that they say? And, and ultimately we used that as a tool to define what our values would be and what our mission would be and what our vision would be. And ultimately it came down to this sort of one concept, which, which we called audience activism. And, um, and we were saying like, we are audience activists and, and, and our business focuses not on planning events, but on the technical infrastructure and production management of events. So we, the guys that are there at 3 a.m., setting up the screen, setting up the speakers, making sure there's power, making sure your PowerPoint's going to work. But what happens in our industry so often is, is like the, the sound engineer will say the speaker has to go there because that's where it's going to give us the best sound. Or the lighting guy will make the lights look really good but but then when the room's filled with 600 people, someone is stuck with a beam of light in their face. And so we were saying like, how can we go above and beyond? How can we go, like our client is important to us, but what's more important is the experience of the audience. So can the lighting designer go and sit in a couple of chairs and make sure that there isn't gonna be a light shining in their eyes? Can the sound engineer do a sound check at the front of the stage, at the back of the stage, at a seated position, at a standing position? And then more than that, it came into the business. So everything in a company is transactional at some level. You know, when sales goes to finance for a PO or a purchase order, at that point in time, the finance person is the salesperson's audience. And so how can that, those two people in that transaction make sure that they're giving each other the best experience? And then vice versa. When the, the minute this, this, the finance person takes that request, then sales becomes their audience. And so, so we got to this concept and we got some amazing values out. But then I started to realize that everyone has a different way of internalizing and understanding values. And, and now I see that all over the world. Um, and, and like you say, you, you go into a strategy meeting and, and just for fun, you go, you're sitting with the Exco team and you go, guys, what's your vision, mission and values? And everyone's like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> they know them, they feel them, they live inside them. Okay. But the problem is that, that, that they, that they are experienced different by everyone. And so when I think when you've got a company of less than 30 staff, it's quite easy as an entrepreneur because you can be in touch with them regularly and, and the purpose and the vision and the mission, whatever you call it, and the values kind of flow through the entrepreneur into the business. But when you go over 30, um, or I always joke, I always joke with my HR manager. I said, we only started having HR problems when we hired you, but, uh, <laughs> but that's just a joke. Uh, I don't want any bad messages from HR people. Um, but when you go over 30, it becomes really hard and you have to formalize these things. And so we used to start using the Kahoot voting feature at staff meetings. And we would, we would say, guys, let's discuss one of our values today. And we'd put the values up on the screen and staff would vote which value we would discuss. And I remember the one day, one of our values is collaboration. And I, but, but one of our values is also give a shit. And, um, and so give a shit is like, what are the things that you do in the organization that you're not paid to do? You know, so, so like, what are the things that you're doing that, that like you're not paid to do? And, and so when we started discussing collaboration, like it was evident for, for very many people that it was, you know, um, so-and-so was struggling with this. So I went to help them to sort that out. And while there may have been an element of collaboration in there, it definitely wasn't how we envisaged it to be as a value in the business. How we envisaged it to be as a value in the business is how do people sit around a table and feel secure enough to challenge each other, to come up with different and unique ways to solve problems? How do we team up with industry experts in their fields and offer a better 
um, product or service to our clients. And so I think it's incredibly important that values get discussed and that that, that organizations understand how do how do how are the values perceived at a senior level and how are the values perceived and understood at, at, at more junior levels through the company because sometimes they they're really different and um and, and then those lead into culture which for me my definition of culture I don't know whether it's right or wrong is like what are people doing when no one is watching so how are you behaving? How are you acting when, when no one is watching? Very, uh, very powerful. And so what we're saying then is discussing the values becomes very critical to helping make sure that everyone has a shared understanding. Does it mean the same thing? What I take that value to mean may be very different to what you take it to mean or what someone else would take it to mean. So I think it's a really important principle. Hey, Dylan, uh, in the interest of time, I want to make sure that we get through the, the next question as well, which is, we on the show because we believe that the quality of the questions we ask ourselves really impacts the quality of the life that we lead. With that being true, what's one question that you've asked that's had the biggest positive impact on your life or the life of the uh, the clients and team that you serve? Yes. Yeah, so again, so hard to just come up with one answer. And I thought about this quite intensely, but I think the question is, how can I live a life without fear? And, and so for me, there's so much wrapped up in that. And obviously I want to help other people to do that as well. And, and I think it's something that has crystallized over COVID because, well, and in the first sort of three years of, of running my business, I was working hundred hour work weeks and I was really burning out and uh, I struggled massively with anxiety because I had all these massive goals that I wanted to achieve. And I actually ended up in hospital quite a few times with panic attacks. And I remember when my wife was 39 weeks pregnant, it was 2 a.m. I was, thought I was dying again, having a heart attack, having a proper panic attack. Go to A&E at the hospital and they, they all ran to my wife. And my wife's like, no, we're here for him. He's having a panic <laughs> attack. And, and then COVID comes along, right? So like one of the biggest, biggest things to ever upset the world and especially the events industry we lost like 95 percent of our revenue in year one we were a big organization at that point and um and and i was like what am i gonna do like where's this anxiety what's gonna happen you know i could really i could really lose everything and um and, and i love sort of a lot of the stoic symbolism and they've got a they've got a sort of practice which in English is is basically negative vision boarding and in Latin it's called premeditatio malorum and it means that like what would your life look like and if you if you played everything out like what are the things that could go wrong and so me and my wife sat down and we started going okay we could lose everything what does that look like you know we we may not drive the same cars we may not live in the same house we may not have the nice holiday house at the coast um and then we started that process was quite painful but then we started looking at it and we started saying okay well, we got three daughters and even though they've all got their own bedrooms every night they sleep in someone's room together and one of them ends up on the floor um, you know, literally on the carpet with a blanket and a pillow. So we were like, cool. We, at, at the very least, we need a two bedroom apartment. And both of us had skills that we could commercialize. And, um, and once we'd been through this whole process, all the fear was stripped away. And I realized that I could only focus on the things that I could control. And COVID ended up being one of the best experiences of my life. And, um, I mean, I, I remember saying to people this as well, for the entire duration of COVID, I, I hardly ever checked my bank account, the business bank account, because I knew we didn't have enough money to service the debt. But what I did do is I spoke to suppliers and I said to them, I will make a payment every week, even if it's $10, I will make a payment. And somehow the money just showed up. And, and, and I started living this life without fear. And it, it really has been so empowering. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not always true. You know, I do still, there are still things that you fear, but I'm so aware of it now that at, at the point that I feel, feel scared, I can go, is this a rational fear 
or is this an irrational fear that's just taking up bandwidth in my mind? And that sort of led me to living life more as an experiment where I go, instead of judging something being good or bad, you know, judging, I used to have a business with 60 employees. Now I've got a business with 16. Instead of judging that as being good or bad, I've gone, I wonder what it would be like to run a business with 16 employees. And, and it's been remarkable in February and, and July coming up this month, we are set to have record breaking months in kilowatt in the 15 years that we've been running the business. And so I feel that living life without fear and living life more as an experiment has just changed my life so much. So much gold in there. So much gold. Uh, living your life without fear. And so the question is, how could I live a life without fear? You said a couple of really interesting things that I want to pick up on. This idea of a negative vision board. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't heard that before. I have, I've never done that. So you're basically saying project out all your worst case scenarios, get, get them out. You, would you literally put them up in pictures and visions or will you write them out? How yeah, would you so do that? I am um, assembled and a, a bit of a worksheet, a whole lot of questions that I asked. And yes, it sounds so strange. I mean, that's a, that's a podcast all on its own. But um, as, as Westerners, we get taught about positive visualization and positive vision boards. What's the car I want? What color is it? What color are the seats? What does it smell like? How am I going to achieve this? And it's all about drive, 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 drive. And, and sort of this philosophy is what are potentially the things that could go wrong? And how can I put myself in that emotional state? But also, how can I foresee things that I may not have foreseen and take evasive action. And so there's actually a phenomenal Harvard Business Review report done on this. There's actually a lot of companies that have implemented this. So before they start a big project, they have a pre-meditatio pre malorum session where they all come in a room and they go, okay, we've just completed this project. What went right and what went wrong? And they just literally try and create this vision board of what the potential outcomes could have been. And for that, it, it was emotional. There were lots of tears, I'm not going to lie. But um, it got me to this place of being able to go, I can't control this. If this is going to happen, we will be okay. And it, it allowed me to take that fear away, which allowed me to create the space to actually solve the problems and not just give all that bandwidth to the thoughts going on in my head and that right there is complete gold because so often the uh the worst thing can play out in our mind and we leave it kind of unquestioned it just it keeps running running and running and running and it's part of our brain's job to do that to look out for these things but what you're really advocating is look identify those things and don't just let them fester let's work out what is an evasive action plan what are the contingencies yeah. what are the things we could do and if we did hit the worst case scenario are we going to be okay? Like, and you're basically saying, look, if I hit the worst case scenario on this, I'm going to find a way to be okay. I, I'm actually going to be okay. We're going to figure this out anyway. And that gives you a lot of power because then you can move forwards and say, even if the worst case scenario happens, I, I've got to handle it. I'm going to cover that off. Um, and what's, what's most empowering about that? I think Dylan, you, you mentioned it was kind of another question in there. You know, what can I control? If this thing's outside of our control and we can't control it, well, <laughs> why am I putting my energy into it? Let's put my energy exactly. into the thing I really can grasp and I can move and I can uh, I can take the relevant yeah. action on. I completely love that question and the whole example around that. And it sounds like it's made a pretty major difference in your life. Absolutely. And also when you figure out what it is that you can really control, it's really simple, Kevin. You can really only control your thoughts and your actions and how you emotionally show up in the world. You can't, you can have influence on other things, but you can't control it. And, and the more we go up, there's this concept called the circles of control. And the, the more you go up the ladder of things that are massive that you can't control, like COVID or terrorism or inflation, or the, the more you start thinking about those things, the more your anxiety levels go up. Um, and as entrepreneurs, we think we can control our children, our spouses, our staff. We, we can't, <laughs> we can't even control our dogs. We can influence them. But, uh, but, but really, if you, if you break it down to what it is that you really can control, it's you, it's your actions, it's your, um, attitude, it's your emotional state. And, and what are you doing about that? 
powerful question. What are you doing about that? Uh, I love this idea of the uh, the negative vision board. And I think I'm going to play this one out with my wife and, and see what comes up from it. And you said there's a whole podcast episode in that. And, and maybe Dylan will, will let, if we can we can get hold of you, we'll invite you back. Yeah, absolutely. I, for one, yeah, I would certainly it. love to hear more about that and to be able to go through that process. Uh, hey, now, before we run, I'd love to just check in on uh, one, one final thing. You've done so many amazing things. As I mentioned, you've um, rafted down the mighty Sambesi River. You completed a full Ironman triathlon. You ran the London Marathon. You cycled from London to Paris. Uh, hey, you've even uh, competed against a Formula One racing legend in a reality TV series. Um, we, we didn't get to hear about those things uh, so far today. <laughs> Tell us, you, you kicked off some amazing things on your bucket list. What's on the horizon? What's maybe one thing that you, uh, you still aspire to do, one thing you haven't got to yet? Yeah, so look, I think that... Uh... That again, I should say that that I'm an Enneagram type seven. Okay. And and people can go Google that, but uh, it's a visionary type. But we also our, our sort of shadow is that we that we we are afraid of pain. Okay. So we're afraid to sit with pain. And what that means we do is we always have these projects on the go. We always have these exciting things on the go because hey, it means that I don't need to deal with any pain. And, um, but on the flip side of that, it, it has created such sort of a colorful life um, and, and just trying things, you know. Um, well, I remember when I signed up to do an Ironman, I didn't really think it through that well, but I'd never <laughs> run more than five kilometers in my life. And it was wow. just an incredible 18 month journey. Um, like going down the Zambezi was really more of a tourist thing, but just amazing nature experience. Um, so what's next? I think that that people always speak about a bucket list, uh, but but people seldom have bucket lists. And and so uh, once a year, I, I pull out Evernote and and I sort of set, you know, some thoughts for the year. Um, and, and I add stuff to my bucket list and I, and I particularly tick things or, or select things out of the bucket list that I think I could achieve. But there's really crazy things on that bucket list, like going to space, uh, becoming a billionaire. But there's also things that are like really easy to achieve, like learning a new language or taking my children on a business trip. And, and I think that, first of all, most of us don't have bucket lists. And second of all, we have we pro we we give bigger things on the on scale of how we view it more credibility than smaller simpler things and for me it's not that for me it's like how can i just put a tick next to something and uh, you know it, it no matter how big or small it is how can i just put a tick next to something and, and tick it off and, and continue to grow that bucket list each year. So what's next on the horizon? Interesting question, because this year I've decided to set no goals for myself. And, and there's this Eastern philosophy that says the unaimed arrow never misses. And, um, and, and I just feel that um, the world has changed so much that I want to just be in an observation state. And now, again, there's a lot of philosophical stuff behind that because the goal of not having goals is a goal in itself. Um, <laughs> and I understand that. But I've just wanted to take a step back and look at what happens and what is happening in this post-pandemic world. And so to just notice what is going on. And so I haven't even selected things off my bucket list this year that I want to go after. Um, but who knows? The biggest surprise every year is, is opening up that Evernote sheet and going, hey, I actually did do this. I actually did go on this holiday or I did do this hike or I did do this. And so actually I did take some things off, but um, I'm trying to just observe and be in a state of awareness for this year. I love that. I think it's great to uh, have that uh, intention to observe. And I really love the, uh, the the quote there. So the unnamed arrow never misses, but uh, it feels like you're going to attract uh, the things that you want into your life anyway, Dylan. Uh, and I know with Circle Forward, uh, lots of opportunities are, are already going to be coming your way. So Dylan, I really appreciated everything you've shared with us today. It's been such an amazing, um, uh, so many tips and lessons in here. Uh, I can't wait to listen to the episode back myself. Uh, if people listening wanted to get in contact with you, 
uh, where is the best place for them to, to reach out to you? Oh, thank you, Karen. First of all, for this opportunity, it's it's always fun to tell your story, and and I really hope that there's something in there for someone somewhere in the world uh, that they could take away to live their highest purpose, um, and because that would make make it all worthy for my purpose. Um, so, if people want to get hold of me, I think the easiest way to do it is on Instagram at Dylan Jerry. Uh, you should be able to see the spelling here. It's it's Dylan, D-I-L-L-O-N-J-E-A-R-E-Y. And in there is a link tree link uh, to all the various other channels that they can reach out to me on, um, all of my websites, the other social media pages um, and contact details. And yeah, always glad to to have a conversation with, with people and and see if we can help them. Brilliant. And wherever you're listening to this or watching this, check out the show notes or the uh, the comment section beneath, and we'll have that link tree pasted in there so you can just click through to uh, to catch up with Dylan. Dylan, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate appreciate all your time and energy today. Thanks very much. And thanks, Kevin, for doing this. I think the success of a podcast is really consistency and, and putting out content all the time. And, and well done for achieving that. I think that's, that would be really hard for me to do. So I'm glad you're doing it. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Cheers, man.